Yes, Roma wines taste better because only Roma selects from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Robert Mitchum in Death at Live Oak, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, those better-tasting California wines enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine, for friendly entertaining, for delightful dining. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Robert Mitchum in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Do you know what death is? It's a simple surgical process whereby a man's name is cut off from his body. If a man's name is dead, the man is dead. Even though his breathing may be normal, his pulse beat regular and strong. My name is dead. So I've become a ghost, a very much alive ghost with hemoglobin in my bloodstream and thoughts in my brain. And yet, as a ghost, I am accused of a crime which I swear to you I did not commit. <laughs> Going up, please. Excuse Name your me, floors, sir. please. Uh, seven, please. Thank you. Name your floors, please. I had just Thank finished you. a rather harrowing day with my That's attorney, all. and I Thanks wanted a few moments' relaxation at the Sky Room before driving home to Palo Alto. As I stood in the elevator, I was conscious seven of floor, someone staring at me. Yes, a girl, wearing an orchid which had been completely crushed against the shoulder of her mink coat. She was young, early 20s, I'd say. The sort of face which I find peculiarly attractive. Lean, tan. She stood perhaps three feet away from me in the elevator. Her eyes stared steadily into mine. I glanced away and then looked back again. She was still staring at me. And then she stepped over close to me. What are you doing here? I, I beg your pardon? Why did you follow me? You know I didn't want to see you. I think you've mistaken me for someone else. 21st floor. You're Rex Melville. My name is Sutherland. Oh, Oh, I'm so sorry. You look exactly... Oh, please, forgive me. Uh, this is your floor, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Um, good night, Mr. Sutherland. Good night. The sky room, sir? Oh, yes, yes, the sky room. Thank you. I'm a flyer, and I like to look down on the on the lights of cities from high places. Usually it makes me feel important and warm inside, but not on this night. I found myself looking down, computing how many miles an hour a human body would be falling by the time it hit the sidewalk. And then I noticed, leaning over the parapet, a few feet away from me, the girl from the elevator. Good evening. Oh, oh good evening. It looks as if I am following you. Yeah. doesn't seem possible. Not the resemblance? Yes, it's almost perfect. You're a little taller, I think. No, my chin comes just below his shoulder, too. You're exactly the same height as Rex. And who is uh, Rex? Uh, a friend. You uh, told me your name on the elevator. I've forgotten it. David Sutherland. I'm Diana Blake. Miss Blake? Yes. Oh, would you care for something to eat, Miss Blake? Yes, I would. We had a rare bit, I think, and we talked about the customary subjects with the expected flippancy. She was beautiful, by every standard except the Flemish. There was a sort of thrilling compactness about her. My mind floated through all sorts of conjectures, but Miss Blake bolted me back to reality. I lied to you. What? My name isn't Diana Blake, it's Mrs. Melville. Rex is not a friend. He's my husband. Oh, somewhat more than a friend. In this case, somewhat less. <laughs> so incredible, so utterly incredible to sit across the table from someone who looks exactly like my husband and, and have a good time. Oh, I better leave. He might find us here. Of course. Philip? 
Yes, Monsieur Sutherland. Check, please. May I see you home? Oh, it's not necessary. I have a suite here in the hotel. Here is the check, sir. Now sign it. May I borrow your pencil, Philip? <laughs> I'm deeply sorry, Monsieur Sutherland. What? Uh, I've been asked to tell you that... Oh, look, uh, I've been signing checks in the Sky Room for five years. Yes, sir, but the accounting department... Please don't hate that... me if I pay it. No, no I couldn't possibly You will allow... find, David, that I'm a woman of extremes. I have either a great deal or nothing. Right now, the only thing I have a great deal of is money. Philip? Thank you, madame. Don't be angry, please. It's a small price for saving my life. Saving your life? When you spoke to me out there on the parapet, I was getting ready to commit suicide. I saw her to the door of her hotel suite, kissed her mentally, and bade her a formal good night. It's been pleasant meeting you, Mrs. Melville, etc. But inside... I knew what had happened to me. And by four in the morning, I knew I'd have to do something about it. Market, oh, 500. I'd like to speak with Mrs. Melville. One moment, please. I'm sorry, sir, there is no Mrs. Melville registered here. Uh, Oh, operator, how how about a Miss Blake? Diana Blake? Oh, well... I'm ringing Miss Blake's apartment. Thank you. Hello? Forgive me for calling this late. David Sutherland. I wasn't asleep. I thought you'd call. I've got to see you. I know, as soon as possible. Let me see, it's 4.15. I'll meet you in the hotel lobby at, oh, better make it an hour from now. No, not the lobby. There's a little coffee shop, Radnick's, around the corner on Post Street. All right, I'll be there. 5.15. It was just growing light as I drove up the bay shore. Practically no traffic. I got to Radnick's in about 40 minutes. She was there waiting for me. We ordered coffee. Well, anything else? Eggs? Toast? No, I'm not hungry. Do you know what I want to talk with you about? I think I know. There are a few things we have to get clear. Are you married? Yes. Well, the hotel had you, has you registered as Miss Blake. Well, I've been separated from Rex for three years. I met him in Buenos Aires. We were married. Didn't work. So I left him. No divorce? I hate scandal. Nobody knew I'd been married. It was foolish, but I just came back here. Became Diana Blake again. And he just dropped out of your life? Until last week. Just showed up out of nowhere. Seems he suddenly needs money, and a wealthy wife's a handy thing to have. Can't you buy him off? Doesn't stop there. He... Wants to live with me. I can't stand being in the same room with him. And he looks exactly like me? That's why I married him. He's very attractive, his appearance. But he's not a human being. He's... And you'd rather kill yourself than live with him. Yes. Now listen to me. Raise your head. Listen to me. Yes. I'd rather die than go through what I have to do this week. You know the firm of Sutherland and Sons? The importers? I used to have a third interest in the company. But there have been some cagey stock manipulations by my dear cousins. I wound up with a safety deposit box full of waste paper. I may have to go through bankruptcy. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, look, we both consider suicide. That's no good. But what would happen if we became... Husband and wife? Yes. What will happen to Rex? Rex is going to become the late... David Sutherland. Oh, no. Now, look. I've thought it all out. I've got some property up in the High Sierras, a summer house called Live Oak. The only way to get there is by air. The place has been advertised for sale. Now, supposing you told Rex that you were interested in buying Live Oak, would you ask him to fly up with me in my plane? Well, he, he likes to fly, but well, he might be suspicious. Oh, you can make it sound logical. Tell him you want to try to make a go of your marriage. Live Oak seems to be an ideal place for a second honeymoon. Yes, I'll try. Does he have any friends in San Francisco? Mm, none that I know of. He's lived in Argentina for years. Oh, one thing, his voice. It's a little higher pitched than yours, and he speaks more precisely. I can get by. Now, what accounts does he have here? Bank accounts? Oh, he doesn't have any. He's using traveler's checks. And the money I've had to give him. Will he stay with you tonight? If I let him. Good. That'll give me a chance to go through his hotel room. Where's he staying? The Park Row. Room? I don't... Oh, yes, uh, 518. 
518. Now, now, tonight, Diana, you tell them about Live Oak. Say I'm a real estate broker. Make some, make some remark about the resemblance. Yes, all right. Tell them that tomorrow night is the only time I can fly him up to the summer house. I'll meet him at the Palo Alto airport at, oh, at 9 o'clock. In the evening? The air is smoother at night. But can you land at Live Oak after dark? No, Diana. But Mr. Melville will never land anywhere. Alive. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Robert Mitchum in Death at Live Oak. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. When you share Roma wine with family or friends, you enjoy fuller bouquet, richer body, and better taste. Yes, Roma wine gives you more enjoyment for your money, an extra dividend of taste pleasure in every sip. To make absolutely sure that Roma wines taste better, Roma selects from California's choicest grapes. Then, with centuries-old skill and winemaking resources unmatched in America, Roma master vintners guide this grape treasure unhurriedly to tempting taste perfection. These choice wines are placed with mellow Roma wines of years before, and from these reserves, the world's greatest reserves of fine wines, Roma later selects for your pleasure. Tomorrow night with dinner, enjoy the superiority, the better taste of Roma, California, Burgundy, or Sauterne. Discover for yourself why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. That's R-O-M-A, Roma, your best buy in good taste. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Robert Mitchum as David Sutherland with Mary Jane Croft as Diana Blake in Death at Live Oak, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I left Diana and went directly out to the airport. I loosened the screws around the cowling of the instrument panel of my airplane. Then I took my parachute home and soaked it thoroughly in a wash tub full of black dye. The shrouds and the silk came out dull black. Just right. As it began to grow dark, I felt a tremendous desire to be with Diana, at least to talk with her. I realized how much she was coming to mean to me. But I stifled my urge to call her. If I could be apart from Diana this one night... I could be with her the rest of my life. I drove back into San Francisco to the Park Row Hotel. As I walked in, I turned my hat brim down on the way Diana had told me Rex Melville wore his. I prepared to speak more precisely to try out my impersonation of the man I was about to murder. Good evening, Mr. Melville. Good evening. May I have the key to 518, please? Certainly, Mr. Melville. You uh, weren't going very long, sir. No, no, not long. Is there uh, any mail in my box? I just gave you your mail, sir. You, well, when you went out. Oh, of course. I'd forgotten. Thank you. I went on up and unlocked the door to Rex Melville's room. Empty. And in a rather slovenly state of disorder, I made it a point to touch everything in the room. The light switches, the water faucets, the drawer handles. I wanted to leave plenty of my fingerprints in case I should need to prove later on that I... The future Rex Melville had occupied this room. Then I left. But I didn't go back to Palo Alto. I just walked the streets of San Francisco until dawn. Who is it? David. Just a moment. Diana. Oh, David, I thought the morning would never come. Rex just left a few seconds ago. Yeah, I know. I've been watching for him outside. He didn't see you. No. How is it? About tonight? Oh, all said. It wasn't easy, but I convinced him. He'll meet you at the Palo Alto airport at nine. Perfect. I took his billfold out of his coat pocket. Here. The signature's on the traveler's check. Good. This is just what I needed. Oh, David, when will it be over? It'll be over before midnight. I'll, I'll be back with you by this time tomorrow morning. Be careful. Do you know... I've never kissed you. Oh, my darling. 
<laughs> Forgive me. I didn't blot my lips. Who could that be? Rex. Hide the billfold. Yes, who is it? Let me in. I've something. Just a moment. I left my wallet. Well, hello. This, uh, this is the real estate man I told you about. My name is Sutherland. Say, you're right, honey. He's a dead ringer for me. Yes, he... I understand we're taking a little trip tonight. Yes, say, you, you make your business calls pretty early in the morning, don't you, Mr. Sutherland? He, uh, he stopped in to find out about tonight. I was just leaving. Good. Now, what about the wallet, honey? It's not here. You sure? If I find it, I'll call you. All right. Why don't we ride down in the elevator together, Mr. Sutherland? You can tell me something about this place at Live Oak. Oh, but Rex, I... Oh, I'll be glad to. Goodbye, Mrs. Melville. I'll see you later, honey. Goodbye. Go ahead, Mr. Sutherland. No, after you. All the way down? Yes, the lobby, please. Right. I hope you're a good pilot, Mr. Sutherland. Been flying for ten years. What kind of plane do you have? Metal mallet monoplane, high wing, seats two people side by side. Say. What's the matter? Are you fellas twins? No. <laughs> I thought for a minute I was seeing double. <laughs> have to go see an eye doctor or something. No, we're not twins. Well, you sure do look alike, though. I'm glad I don't have to see an eye doctor. Oh, here's the main floor. Watch your step. Hello? Hello, Diana? Yes. Listen, we're in bad trouble. What's wrong? The elevator boy. He noticed how much we look alike. Which car was it? The the end elevator, the that one nearest your door. I can take care of it, David. Don't worry. It was a ghastly day of waiting. I wired the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles to reserve a room in the name of David Sutherland. I remarked casually to one of my neighbors that I was flying down to Los Angeles in the evening. Promptly at 9 o'clock, I drove to the airfield. It was dark and deserted. I dumped my black parachute in the pilot's seat and waited. 9.15. No Melville. 9.30. Still no sign of him. About 20 minutes of 10, I saw some headlights turn down the dirt road that leads to the hangar line. Hello, is that you, Sutherland? I've been waiting for you. I'm sorry to be late. I was delayed in town. You all set to go? All set. No one saw him get into the plane. The airport isn't normally equipped for night operation. I didn't waste much time warming at the engine. This would be the last takeoff for my ship, so it didn't make much difference. I gave a full throttle, roared down the asphalt runway, and banked sharply out over the bay. Say, it's kind of pretty up here. Yes, very. How long will it take us to get to Live Oak? Not long. Excuse me, I have to make a radio call. NC-35013 calling San Francisco Radio. I wish to file a flight plan. Over. NC-35013, this is San Francisco Radio. Go ahead with flight plan. This is NC-35013 over Mountain View at 1500. Pilot Sutherland, airspeed 145, fuel supply three hours. CFR, destination Los Angeles Municipal. Los Angeles? Shut up. ETA in Los Angeles, 2345, over. Roger, 013. We will file. San Francisco radio out. Well, why are we going all the way to Los Angeles? You're taking a longer trip than that, Mr. Melville. I grasped the loose cowling from my instrument panel and swung it squarely against his head. He fell forward against the seat belt. There was no blood. The bruise on his face was exactly where the cowling might strike him if an accident threw him forward against it. Quickly, I screwed the cowling back into place, and then I set about exchanging clothes with my unconscious passenger. It was difficult in the cramped cabin, and I had to watch my flight controls. I popped Melville into the pilot's seat and buckled his safety belt. Then I strapped on my own parachute and trimmed the ship nose down. 
As it started to pick up sp- speed in the steep dive, I shoved open the cabin door and leaped. <laughs> My parachute, black against black, dropped me quietly into a meadow a few hundred yards from my burning ship. The wreckage was complete. I pulled in the chute, wadded it up, and tossed it onto my funeral pile. Sleep well, Mr. David Sutherland. had rammed the wild wilderness on the lowest slope of Mount Hamilton. I struck out on foot for the road which I knew from my maps, ran down the mountain from Lick Observatory to San Jose. As I walked along in the moonless night, I felt free. For the first time in many months, no more debts, no more threats of bankruptcy, no more scavenging attorneys. From San Jose, I took the bus back to Palo Alto, keeping as inconspicuous as possible. At the airport, I got into Rex Melville's car. No, it was my car. I was Rex Melville now. It was just getting light as I drove up Bayshore Boulevard. I went into a pay phone booth to call her and tell her everything was all right. Mark at 0500. Miss Blake's apartment, please. Miss Blake? Diana Blake. One moment, sir. I'm ringing Miss Blake's apartment. Hello. Hello? Why should a man's voice answer in Diana's room? I went straight to the park row. The same clerk was on duty who had called me Mr. Melville the night before. Uh, Good morning, sir. Good morning. Key to 518, please. Yes. Yes, Mr. Melville. Why should he stare at me that way? Everything had gone according to plan. What had I done wrong? Hello. Oh, hi. I'm, I must have the wrong room. No, no, no. This is the right room. 518. Come in. I, uh, I've been waiting for you. Although we really didn't expect you to come back here. Well, what, what, what do you want to see me about? Well, there's a little matter of murder. You... You must have the wrong person. My name is Melville. Rex Melville. Yes. Uh huh. This your billfold? Yes, yes, that's mine. There, there's my name on it, Rex Melville. You ought to be more careful where you leave it. Well, where did you find this wallet? Now we want to get a few things straight. Harry, find the elevator boy and have him in here. All right. Now about this, Miss Blake. Uh, what was your relationship with her girlfriend? No, she she was my wife. Ooh. We were married in Argentina three years ago. Well, Mr. Melville, if this woman was your wife, why did she use the name of Miss Blake? Well, we'd been separated. Right. Oh, I see. Uh, did you want to see me, sir? Hey, yeah, yeah. I want you to take a look at this gentleman and tell me if he's ever ridden on your elevator. Oh, yes, sir. I took him down last night from the 21st floor. He was in an awful hurry and sort of nervous. It was just before 9 o'clock. I remember because I go off duty at No, night. no. It, it was someone else. I was in Palo Alto at 9 o'clock. Now, listen. What is this, anyway? Now look at him carefully, son. Are you sure this is the man you took down from the 21st floor? He's even wearing the same suit. I demand to know what right Don't you have you to Don't you remember, question... Melville? Last night, sometime between 8.15 and 5 minutes of 9, you murdered Diana Blake. I don't remember the next hour at all. But I heard myself saying, There's another man. He looks exactly like me. He must have killed her. Oh, sort of Mr. Hyde character? No, 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 another person. Elevator boy, you saw us together in your car yesterday morning. I... I don't remember. I think, think. You asked if we were twins, and you you said something about going to an eye doctor, remember? No, I don't remember. He's lying. He's lying. Diana bribed him not to tell. Why should she have bribed him? Because... Because I, I'm, I'm not Rex Melville. My name is David Sutherland. I live at 18016 Willow Road in Palo Alto. I, I didn't kill her, I tell you. 
I loved her. David Sutherland was killed last night in an airplane crash on Mount Hamilton. No, it was Melville who died. Sutherland radioed a flight plan at 955 for Los Angeles. He had a reservation at a Los Angeles hotel for last night. He never got there. I'm Sutherland. I jumped in a black parachute. Melville, the murderer, he's the one who died. Why are your fingerprints on every doorknob and water faucet at Rex Melville's hotel room at the Park Row? I didn't kill Diana Blake. I loved her. You've been separated from her for three years. You're the murderer. I'm a murderer, yes. I killed Rex Melville, but not Diana. I didn't kill Diana. So, there it is. Now you know what can happen when a man's name is severed from his body. And in a few more moments... I shall know what happens when a man's body is severed from his soul. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma, America's favorite wine. Before we hear again from Robert Mitchum, star of tonight's suspense play, this is Truman Bradley inviting you to enjoy the important difference, the extra dividend of pleasure you find in all Roma wines, in fuller bouquet, richer body, and better taste. Yes, Roma wines taste better because Roma, and only Roma, selects for better taste from the world's greatest wine reserves. That's why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Enjoy the better taste of Roma California Burgundy with your dinner tomorrow. Insist on Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma, a premium wine in everything but price. And now, Robert Mitchum. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure appearing for you on Suspense. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I know you'll like next week's suspense show when Roma Wines brings you Virginia Bruce in a very unusual play about a lonely woman who unknowingly invites murder into her home. See you soon. Thank you. Good night. Robert Mitchum will soon be seen in RKO's Crossfire with Robert Young and Bob Ryan. Tonight's suspense story was written by Robert E. Lee and E. Jack Newman. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Virginia Bruce as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Stay tuned for the thrilling adventures of the FBI in peace and war, following immediately over most of these stations. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Hume Cronin, Angela Lansbury, June Havoc, and others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. For the finest in cherries, remember this name. C-R-E-S-T-A. B-L-A-N-C-A. Cresta Blanca. Cresta Blanca. Yes, the famous California cherries of Cresta Blanca are among the great cherries of the world. And Cresta Blanca has created a sherry for every occasion, for every taste. Ask your wine dealer. Discover the ideal Cresta Blanca sherry for you. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. Tune in again next Thursday, same time for Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>